so good evening all on behalf of bic series 2 and translumina we welcome all Last of speaker k teachers to come we welcome all of you to the session what is right for the left challenges it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our moderator for the session dr sameer gupta dr sameer gupta uh, director catlab metro group of hospitals uh, noida does not need an introduction he is a highly skilled american trained and boarded interventional cardiologist he has authored multiple extracts journal articles book chapters and presented at multiple national and international meetings so uh, sir we welcome to you uh, over to you sir thank you thank you so much uh, this this is going to be a very good session and you know, thank you for having us and thank you transluna for organizing this uh, this is going to be a very uh, a, a good uh, uh, session and it's a very uh, got a very good topic also what is right for the left main um we have uh, some very exciting cases that are going to be presented uh, the case uh, each case is going to be approximately uh, for about 12 minutes uh, and we will have two to three minutes of discussion following each case i have a, a very distinguished uh, list of uh, panelists and chair people with me today uh, dr zaman kahani uh, dr pp mohammed uh, mustafa and dr suresh vijan uh, they are our chair persons who are joining us i would like to welcome all of you thank you so much for joining us and for the panelists we have dr kapil bhargav dr mahindra prasad tripathi uh, dr omar mustafa hasan dr ramanathan dr satish suryavanshi dr viveka kumar dr yadav kumar dio bhata uh, thank you so much uh, for all of you for joining us this is going to be a very exciting and academically uh, invigorating uh, thing because left main pci is still one of the uh, the the holy grails of uh, of cardiology and um, for our case uh, for our first case we have uh, dr mohan Uh, who's going to be presenting common left main uh, PCI challenges tips and tricks? Uh, Dr. Mohan, over to you. Yeah. I actually just found my introduction email, um, Doctor. I'll just take a quick minute and introduce our 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 chair people again, Doctor. Dhiman Kahani. He's from. Uh, he's a he's the director of international cardiology at EM Birla Harvard School in Calcutta, and Doctor. Muhammad Mustafa, the other chairperson, is the managing director and the chief cardiologist for Metro Med International Cardiac Center in Calicut. Uh, Dr. Suresh Vijayan is uh, in, is a consultant in cardiology at Nilavati Hospital in Bombay. And the panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, Kapil Bhargav, he is a uh, head of department and professor of cardiology at the Gitanjali Hospital in Jaipur. Uh, Dr. Mahendra Pratap Tripathi, he is the chief consultant cardiologist at the Care Hospital in Bhubaneswar. Uh, Dr. Umair Mustafa Hasan, he is an international cardiologist at the Allahabad Heart Center. Dr. M. Ramanathan. He is the international cardiologist at the Vijay Heart Hospital in Chennai. And Dr. Satish Suryavanshi, another panelist, uh, he is an uh, international cardiologist at the SMC Hospital in Raipur. Dr. Viveka Kumar, he is the principal director and the chief of the cath lab at the Max Devi Devi Heart Institute in Saket. And Dr. Yadav uh, Kumar Diyabhata, he is the director of cardiology at the Norwich Hospital in Kathmandu. And Dr. Mohan, our first speaker, is speaking from KMCH Hospital in Coimbatore. I apologize. I do not have that the the, the designation slide open. Doctor Mohan, we cannot see your slides if you open them. I have I have done a sharing the screen actually. Uh, sir, you might have to reshare the actual PowerPoint. We can see your uh, desktop of sorts. Can you able to see now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. And I don't want to uh, waste the time. And uh, I have a three common uh, uh, scenarios of left main uh, thing. And this is the first case of seventy-two year old male, ACS, unstable angina, 
diabetic nephropathy with the chronic kidney disease and renal anemia, normal liver function with the diabetes and as well as hypertension, having a carotid disease, this fellow is having a left main triple vessel disease. So here the case scenario is uh, uh, the age is high and renal problem and as well as uh, carotid disease and CKD. So <clears throat> Uh, since it's been CKD, we all know the thing, uh, we have to reduce the dye and because the patient is not on dialysis and age is also 75. And you can able to see the thing straight away, there is a two wire and one on the looped wire on the LAD and LCX. And LCX I have measured from the, uh, I have done uh, the, 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 the IVAS for all the cases, the pre and post, I will uh, post it later. And uh, so this is uh, uh, the wire, then subsequently the wire uh, has been, uh, wire measuring has been done. Then the pre-dilatation, you can able to see after the pre-dilatation uh, uh, the vessels and subsequently the IVS has been done. And uh, this is a, the, uh, the, all the three cases which I'm going to show is been a, uh, the mini crush or been a DK crush. And uh, you can able to see the thing there is a LC extending. You can see that the balloon which has been kept on the distal at LAD because I used to do a, instead of the stent crush, I always used to do the uh, balloon crush and uh, <clears throat> So this, you can see the thing, it's been a balloon crush. You can see the uh, typical balloon crush where you can get an organized crush. Why I'm saying organized crush means you can pull out the balloon while you are deploying the LC extending. You can pull out and you can deploy it more. Uh, then subsequently you can take out the balloon. Uh, by the time when you do the, uh, uh, the, the, the balloon crush, you can get an organized uh, uh, balloon crush. You can see on the next slide that how to do the, uh, I mean, how the, uh, after the crush, how it will be. You can see that that LC extending how it has been crushed by the balloon, and subsequently the LAD uh, uh, the shot has been taken, and uh, uh, with uh, already the IVS measurement we have, and uh, so this is after the mid LAD stenting the same balloon which has been taken and the measurement has been done again. You can see that since I have used extra backup catheter, this iota steel wire which I have done to avoid the the stent which will get. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the crushed by the uh, or injured by the uh, the guiding catheter and you can see the thing I can put all, uh, the iota steel wire from the uh, below to up actually uh, instead of the uh, uh, above to up and uh, this is a Australian MCA with the classical that uh, yellow cranial view and uh, subsequently this is a rewiring and you can see the thing uh, uh, um, the rewiring uh, very clearly, it's a possibility of a distal stud because I went uh, uh, to the LAD and came up, then finally entered into the, this one. And uh, you can see that IATO uh, osteal wire is still been floating, and subsequently the simultaneous kissing balloon. Uh, then the final part, then you can able to see the final result of the uh, uh, the angio. So this is a classical uh, LAO uh, um, uh, caudal view, which you can able to appreciate the uh, uh, left mine um, uh, bifurcation. And uh, so here the thing is, this is a pre and a post uh, LAD MLA, which has been very good. And uh, this is for the LCX. And this is a real uh, time uh, uh, IVAS. Uh, and you can see that minimal calcification, see the bifurcation, the figure of eight with, uh, without being any strength, strength which has been protruding. And uh, so this is uh, 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 the LMCA and the LAD LCX, uh, the bifurcation level of uh, MLA. And this is the case number two, the 73 year old male, again, a old age, which is here, not unstable angina, it's a non elevation MI, acute LV failure, again, a old CVA, normal pressure hydrocephalus, and the critical distal of mine, double result disease. So you can appreciate the thing, it has been a classical Medina 111. And uh, here I have taken a, a JL catheter, because just, just want to show off that, how we can able to do the JL uh, uh, for the uh, that Medina 111. That's why I've taken a JL. Uh, otherwise, usually the common uh, thing is better to take a uh, extra backup catheter you would have seen in the last uh, uh, case. And uh, here the LV function and other things being normal. And uh, so here the wire again, again the measurement. So I always follow the two rules. One is with the angiographic uh, measurement with the wire and subsequently with the uh, IVAS measuring. So both the thing I'll compare and I do that. That will be the better way of uh, uh, approach any uh, uh, bifurcation PCA. That's what I feel. And you can see the thing there is a both LAD and L6 wire being folded and because to avoid the distal injuries. And uh, again, the remains the same, all other steps were remains the same. 
and uh, <clears throat> so adequate pre dilatation then uh, the, the the subsequently there has been a, a stenting of lcs uh, then the balloon has been kept at lad then the balloon crush that it has been organized to crush then you can see that uh, there is a good flow at lad also um, then subsequently the lad uh, uh, the stent deployment and you can see that uh, there is a for the side wire i have done a little bit of uh, dilatation at the lmca for the side wire crossing that's called pso the proximal side optimization then the recross of side branch and uh, the simultaneous kissing balloon and uh, subsequently final part and you can see the thing uh, the final angio with the uh, bina left main uh, uh, led lcx bifurcation uh, with the timi 3 flow and this is with the uh, the jl guide with the medina 111 and you can uh, see the appreciate the led four flow and as well as the uh, led lcx flow this has been a pre and post led mla uh, which has been very good and uh, this is at the lcx then the figure of eight and uh, then this is a, a live uh, ivs of uh, this patient this is a case number 3 which has been a 57 year old male the infro post oval stemi for which i have done a rescue pc to mid rca that time had a mild distal lmca triple vessel disease normal early function so here is a middle aged male uh, with a uh, with a complex one and here again you could able to see the thing there is a complex anatomy because led in lcx been a 90 degree angle and the led been which is a tortuous as a age of 57 more tortuous with a minimal uh, calcification we all know the thing the wiring of led itself been very difficult and as well as the lcx and here again i have taken a jl instead of the uh, extra backup this is again just want to show off that how we can able to do the uh, uh, the, the jl uh, with this uh, uh, the particular anatomy of the vessel and uh, you can see the thing the tortuosity of the led again and again a crossability of lcx is not easy then i made a two bends for the uh, lcx uh, wire so primary current as well as the secondary current then only i could able to manage i think because of this uh, the wrong uh, uh, the, the guide selection we all know the thing there will be a backup support won't be there so always will be a practical difficulties will be there that is the only reason i have taken this case for to show off that how difficult will be there when you take a wrong uh, uh, the guide and the all remaining steps were same these kind of tortuous vessels always better to take a small uh, uh, balloon with a longer length uh, that will be better for to dilate the for the pre dilatation the subsequently you can upsize the, uh, the the balloons and uh, so you can appreciate that uh, there is a small i mean concentric phenomena at the lady um, and as well as the the flow has been good after the pre dilatation and subsequently all the remaining works were same again uh, the, the very uh, uh, mini crush because it's only the angle is 90 90 so i have uh, did a, uh, uh, the mini crush technique here and uh, uh, and uh, so you can able to appreciate the thing again a balloon crush then the subsequently uh, the led stenting then the uh, recross and uh, simultaneous uh, uh, the kissing balloon on the uh, on the uh, final part and you can able to appreciate the final result of uh, this patient and this is led coral view we can able to say the this one so the thing this is a pre and post uh, led and as well as lcx and bifurcation you can able to see the figure of eight without uh, no uh, protrusion of any stud uh, uh, thing and uh, so take a message here is all left main pc always a planned steps of approach always risk to be apply, explained to the attenders in whatever the case it is uh, the cons and pros and prepare all your complex case uh, catheter materials which uh, are to verify it that is very very important long complex procedure better to wear a, a, a condom catheter or foliar catheter to the patient and choose your dye as per your uh, gfr it's very very important and adequate hydration if suppose lv is normal and renal protective measures if lv is low especially resident party and anesthetic backup when you do all the left main spin better and uh, reduce your op schedule on the day that will be better to free work uh, free of work free of work uh, for the uh, left main pca and make sure the imaging machines are working on the previous day itself or sometimes you give a big, very big problem on the day of procedure inform your cath lab in charge that in regards the case because uh, they may send you the junior for the uh, case you may stuck up uh, in between so if planning for very complex case inform your comfortable colleague regards may need a help 
and that should be very important. And radial or femoral access, as per the operator convenience, beef bullet pad, all the left main PCA better to keep it. I always used to do that. And new catheters, wires, new balloons, always to avoid the spasm, wire wrapping, and easy crossability. Do different colors of wire, and with the two different colors of torque, you can able to use it. And avoid more sinus, especially in a patient is having a renal failure. You can do a fluorosave uh, because radiation injury can be less. Recross side branch always with using a new, a new wire. And uh, the balloon crush is uh, quite good if you're able to do that thing before uh, side branch tending. And uh, after uh, side branch tending, pull out the side branch for the proximal side optimization. It will uh, uh, allow you for the recross, so facilitate the recross. So that you have to always post it, pull the balloon, post it after the side branch is ending. And a simultaneous kissing balloon or individual post dilatation, both can be done. Either one, whichever you have been comfortable, depends on the anatomy and difficulty you are able to do is. Use iota osteal wire whenever you are using extra backup catheters because this will in stop the injury after this one. And the final part is always use a lesser length balloon that is left main, which is less than 12 millimeter. And the post PC angio better take with wires in. Because otherwise, once wire has come out, the, all the uh, thing will come out. You may not get a good picture. And keep referral image on site to avoid the use more dye. And periodic ACT monitoring, we all know the thing. And while tracking balloon stents, imaging catheters, always open the OD white catheter because uh, the, the, the hot portion uh, has to get move on. And imaging catheters, pre and post PCI, always must in all the left main uh, uh, the PCI. And uh, the the prolonged ischemic balloon inflation which has to be avoided in left mind. That's a very my sincere advice. And uh, always any change in hemodynamics, definitely you look for the resection, perforation, pericardial terminate, slow flow, no flow, coronaries or monitor issues. And use more necorandal and GTN frequently to avoid the spasm of the vessels, which has been quite common when you're doing a left mind. And the renal issue patient, the pre-PCA uh, ABG is mandatory to assess the acidosis and as well as hypoxia. And a prolonged complex procedure, always check your sugars, that would be better. And, uh, and uh, so the remaining things were bailout methods. Always you have to know what the alternative bailout methods. No complication can happen without your, uh, uh, the basic step, if you forget, always the complication starts. Then the one by one, all the complication will get start. And uh, complex left pain cases, always easy to do when you plan and execute in wise manner. And asking for the help to the other colleague when you are at a trouble, follow it's very, very important. And shouting at the cath lab, it's not going to serve your purpose because that time you may be in more negative impact on patient because patient will be listening what you have been talking and staff colleagues, which may lead to again a more and more complication that has to get avoided. So that's what, thank you so much for the giving opportunity to show all the three cases in comprehensive manner. Thank you. I feel this is a common complication which you come out across in this thing. Thank you very great and uh, educational cases dr mohan you know the you used a lot of very good techniques you know the the aorta osteal wire and and everything else uh, like then now like to invite uh, our panelists and chair people to come and give uh, if they have any comment uh, dr mustafa you're right there uh, what are your thoughts yeah thank you very much uh, dr mustafa for showing a billion three cases uh, but you know in port uh, I think if you go for DK crash, because of course it was edited and all the details we could not see, but uh, but the uh, all the cases were very elegantly done. So thank you very much. Congratulations for that. But uh, normally we go for port three times. So we didn't see in any of the cases uh, that uh, when do you do the ports, you know, you showed only the final port. You were right, you chose a small balloon so that it doesn't cross the proximal end of the uh, stent. And, uh, you know, that gives much leverage to enter the side branch later on. So when do you do the ports in DK crash? Normally, the best thing is uh, once you after the deploy the uh, that uh, uh, that uh, side branch stenting, then while you are uh, doing your uh, the, the 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 recrossing of the this one uh, the side branch, then subsequently you can do the uh, part of the uh, that uh, 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 LAD LMCA and LCX. Then you can uh, enter the uh, LAD uh, uh, the the the, the stent. That will be uh, the the better thing. 
Uh, I think the pot should be done three times, you know, in decay crush. First, we should do it after SB dilatation and main branch dilatation, okay? And after oh, because I didn't show the, I could not able to show the fully, sir, because the problem yeah, is uh, okay. That's why that's why I understand the multiple why, things. Why so, I am uh, why sorry. I am uh, having these issues. I told you I congratulated you because you have done all the cases very rightly, and uh, because I told already that probably because of addition, because you couldn't uh, show all the steps, so probably you couldn't see. But you know. Normally, there are, I believe, many PGTs over here, and it's our duty to educate them. So, for their knowledge, tell that, uh, you know, after the initial side branch dilatation and the main branch dilatation, we should do one spot yeah. with a yeah. small balloon. Same things would be there. And number two, after the side branch stenting, we should do the second part. And third one, as you told when you did it at last, and... Uh, after that finishing, you know, you do a kissing balloon. That facilitates the wear movement. And uh, please tell us something about your choice of the side branch dilatation, because you have done very nicely side branch, uh, you know, balloon, your choice of balloon and what should you look for during uh, doing the kissing balloon with the side branch balloon, what should you look for, the side branch balloon? Yeah, side branch balloon, I always use uh, uh, the NC balloon, sir. The initial thing is when you are crossing the thing, uh, I will always look up that thing, whether we could able to uh, uh, the, the cross the wire freely. If I could able to cross the wire freely and the same size balloon, which I could able to take it for the uh, LCX and uh, the, uh, the LED. And uh, again, a one third of the uh, that uh, the corresponding LCX person and two third of the LED, I'll do the simultaneous kissing. And so that will be the better. The NC balloon used to I always prefer, sir. No, we should look at certain things uh, regarding the side branch. You are right that we should take it one is to one, Dr. Yeah. Mohan. And then it should be a short balloon and uh, yeah. should not cross much beyond the ostium. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. During kissing also, we should not cross much beyond the ostium, just little proximal to the ostium. So these are very important points. And initial always go for high pressure side branch dilatation. And then you go for the main branch dilatation at average pressure 12, 14, like that. And then go for the kissing balloon. While doing the kissing balloon, you should remember that the side branch balloon should be one is to one. And it should be NC balloon, what you have rightly told. And it should cross the ostium a little and it should be little proximal. And then we should go for that because all these steps are very important. Otherwise, it will be very difficult, as you have done. And there was some calcium in the third case. It was a very crooked artery. You have done very nicely. You haven't any plan for rotablation? Uh, no, sir. So the calcium was... That not also, a... we saw that from 10 o'clock to uh, 1 o'clock position, there were a lot of calcium there. Uh, yes, sir. Because this could able to yield well, sir. The calcium is not uh, uh, the much... Uh, the... Uh, the heavy calcium, which I could, because the age is also been less, and which I could be able to crack, because I was in the plan of doing it, but it was a very, uh, the, the less than 180 degree of calcium, I don't want to do the, this one. So with the balloon, I could able to crack it, so that's the reason why you can able to see the thing, there is a, the cracking marks in the, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the IVS, so, uh, so that's the reason why I could able to finish it. Otherwise, I would have taken an OPN balloon, or a, uh, again, subsequently, I have to do the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Rota. Uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time, should we just go forward to the next case? There were some very good discussions and a lot, a lot of learning that happened over there. Uh, Dr. Mohan, congratulations on those great cases that you've showed us. And very good. Very well done. Yeah. Very nice cases. In the interest of time, let's go forward. Uh, we're already 10 minutes behind time. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Deepthi. Uh, she's going to present a case of left mean bifurcation stenting in a high syntax score. Uh, Dr. Deepthi is joining us from Care Hospitals in Hyderabad. Sir, good evening, welcome, respected panel members, moderator. Uh, am I audible, sir? And yes, yes. Are my slides visible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. After the nice cases by Dr. Mohan, mine is a simpler case. Uh, this is about, this is a case of left main bifurcation leash intervention we did in a person with high syntax score. 
As we all know, around 4 to 6 percent of all CAGs we encounter have critical left main disease, and in two thirds of the times, they are associated with concomitant triple vessel disease. Isolated LMCA disease is less, less often, particularly involving only osteum. We have to suspect non atherosclerotic etiologies. More often in females, we notice ito arteritis and all. Coming to my case, he's a 75 years gentleman, uh, hypertensive, hypothyroid, asthmatic. He's a non diabetic. He had past history of stroke seven months prior to presentation with this ACS. And he is a CKD with uh, creat around 1.8, stage 3B. And uh, he had a recent ACS, was admitted in an outside center. And his echo was suggestive of moderate LV dysfunction and angio done outside was suggestive of element TBD. I'm going to show the video shortly. Because of this critical triple vessel disease advised bypass and as part of the preoperative workup is MR angio of the brain vessels, cerebral vessels were done which showed diffuse narrowing of internal carotid artery, both intracranial segments and extracranially. So the surgeon had refused and in view of the very high risk nature and he was put on optimal medications. However, he was having recurrent rest and general episodes and this is when he consulted our hospital. This is the picture of the angio. Mm. This shows a uh, distal left main disease extending into proximal LAD and circumflex. And uh, the LAD, distal LMCA is a hazy calcific lesion extending into LAD. And the LAD lesion is long segment up to the mid portion. And noticeably, the most important thing was the dominance of the left system. Left circumflex was dominant. So with this picture in mind, we uh, explained to the patient, obviously, uh, the option of high-risk uh, PTCA with the help of imaging guidance and IABP support. And also wrote a plaque modificative strategies. Rotablation was kept in the backup. Overall risk we discussed with the family. And as we all know, this we are familiar with this algorithm. This particular person, he had a distal LMCA bifurcation lesion and the circumflex was critical more than 70 percent long segment lesion so we planned for a directly two stent strategy and as as far as the available data we planned for the dk crush technique but uh, just when this procedure was planned in the morning of the day uh, he had a syncope in the washroom and he had a symptomatic severe bradycardia so he was shifted to the lab and this procedure was uh, preponed by few hours and a tpi was inserted through the right femoral vein and right femoral artery was used for the coronary intervention left femoral artery was used for iabp it was wide with the extra backup guiding and work hot fires. We used Renato and BMW to the circ and LAD. And we did pre-dilatation with 1.52 and 2.5. And later we did an IVUS run. And this was our IVUS pictures pre-procedure. I'm sorry, the running image just were not playing. So this shows a sick, even after pre-dilatation, a significant plaque burden, very narrowed out luminal areas and calcification, but occupying around a quadrant. So and even the LMCA was significantly narrow. So with this picture, we though we kept rota standby, we thought it was not needed. And we subsequently went ahead with a flexotome 2.510 and 310 cutting balloon. And then subsequently, after adequate plaque modification, we did we deployed the middle lady stent with the 328. Uh, and subsequently, the circumflex and the LAD were tackled in the DK crest strategy. The circus stent was deployed. Prior only balloon was placed in LED as already shown earlier cases and we crushed it subsequently did the first kiss and then deployed the LM to LED stent and this was the result after stenting. Uh, we subsequently did again routine the kiss and a pot. pot we did and after the kiss we did again a report and this was the final result. Uh, this was the final result and patient tolerated the procedure and post-procedure I was areas of around 7 in LAD and 6 in circumflex and 8.4 in LAD were achieved and uh, he was uneventful post-operative period. Creatinine transiently increased but uh, subsequently stabilized. We could manage, we could manage it conservatively and uh, overall around 100 ml contrast was used. IABP and TPI were removed the next day. And now it is one year since the time of the procedure. He's doing well. As we all know, unprotected left main interventions can be challenging. And 
to carry high risk, particularly in the left dominant system. But the key is proper bed preparation and the value of imaging. This helps us to choose our appropriate hardware and even in uh, higher syntax score we can use, uh, we can achieve reasonable result with the help of imaging and proper bed preparation. Very important is a hard team approach, discussion with surgeon and communicating with the patient family, particularly when we are beginning the left main program to not have any issues. And value of imaging is how much ever is said is still less, particularly in left main cases, so as to ensure a good immediate technical success as well as ensuring optimal long-term outcomes. And very useful to have hemodynamic support devices, particularly involving when we are doing left main bifurcation lesions, more so when the left system is dominant, IABP, impella, whatever. But in our center, we used only IUBP. And last but not the least is after this much work we do on the patient, to maintaining a close follow-up and ensuring drug compliance so that he adheres to the drug, uh, proper drug. And uh, thank you, everyone. It's a teamwork which helps us to get good results. That's all. I have one case to present. Thank you. No, Dr. Geethi, this, this one case was a very good case, and, and thank you for sharing it. Um, any any comments from? Uh, I think uh, I think I would just like to make one comment. In uh, we are all talking of imaging for left main, but please remember, EBC main just uh, they showed data uh, at the latest uh, PCR meeting and. What is very clear is that in the EBC main left main study, the use of imaging was very, very minimal in a randomized trial. So yes, we all think imaging is great. We should have it. But please remember in groups of people where they're doing left main all the time, imaging is not very common. So that's something that we need to remember. For our society and our setup, imaging is not routinely available for everybody. So clearly you ought to have another alternate backup plan for sizing your vessels. And I think finite law is probably the thing that you should have pasted on your cath lab. Use that law to size your stand, size the left main. Don't forget that you need to do pot regularly and effectively and with a small balloon. And even if you don't have imaging, you will get good results. Very well done, Deepti. Excellent Thank case, you. wonderful disposition. The patient you, was very bad, low ejection fraction, history of cerebral stroke, so many things. So beautiful case. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next. Yeah, any other comments from any of the other panelists, Dr. Bhaga? Yeah, I just wanted to know from these operators that what is the balloon size that used to, to crush the side branch stand? Is it uh, according to the left main or according to the LED? I'm sorry, Dr. Bhargav, can you repeat the question? Yeah. When uh, when you are crushing the side one stand, what is the size of the balloon uh, to crush the stand? Is it according to the left main or is it according to the LED size? That's a great point. Uh, I, I, I prefer according to the size of the left main because you unless you need to crush it properly, then all other next steps will be I mean, very difficult, especially left main to LED standing. So it's always, uh, you should crush it very well. Otherwise, uh, you can have a lot of problem like uh, stand getting trapped in there and things like that. O others' opinion is also very valuable. Yeah, yeah, you do the left main and you have to keep the balloon size also small because you don't want to take like a 4 and put it into the proximal LED at a high pressure. That can cause its own set of problems. Yeah. Dr. Vijayan, you were, you were having the point? Dr. Vijayan, we can't hear you. Yeah, you unmute yourself. Suresh, you unmute yourself. You are not audible. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Vijay, we can't hear you. There's some of this thing. Um, so, in the meantime, there is a question which has come up on the. Yeah, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Two issues here. One, uh, sizing of the balloon for pot has to be different from sizing of the balloon when you're doing a crush. And that's why the pot step becomes important. If you're going to use uh, to crush the stent with a balloon size to the left main, uh, left LED, then you need to crush the stent properly because only then you will get a good access to your side branch. So it depends on what you do routinely. Both are absolutely acceptable so long as you're aware of what you're doing and accordingly you're going to correct yourself uh, to do the crush properly 
and pot that uh, proximal part of your uh, side branch stent against the wall of the main vessel. Wait, uh, there's a question which has come up on the chat. Uh, this is a question, you know, we have an engaged audience. Um, this is a question for Dr. Deepthi. Is it better to use mechanical circulatory support up front, even if just a balloon pump in such cases? I mean, the patient had LV dysfunction, left dominant, old age, and all of the high risk features. Yes, I personally feel in distal LM bifurcation lesion, and particularly in this particular gentleman, the left system was dominant. Practically, RC is non dominant, entire myocardial sub. So, upstream first only we placed IABP. It is yeah. better. Yeah. So, so supposing the LV distal LV LM bifurcation, otherwise maybe shaft or osteal these hemodynamic support devices, yeah. maybe little less, uh, and the other concomitant clinical features, his LV dysfunction. So we planned for uh, and his uh, significant rest tangential episodes ongoing. He crashed. So this patient, it is prudent in general. Also for distal left main bifurcation, I think more expert uh, panel members can give more idea. But I personally feel distal LM bifurcation lesion having a hemodynamic support device is always better. And IEPP is simple and cost effective. It's easily available. I think uh, it should be used. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Really depends upon the, what the EF of the person is, if there's any mitral regurgitation yeah. factors too. But the thing about uh, mechanical circuitry support is if you're thinking about it, then you better have it. If you're not thinking of a different issue, but if you're thinking about it, then clearly you better go upfront with it. It makes your life very, very simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Dr. Patel, um, are you going to present next? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So should we carry on with the next presenter? I think let's do that. Um, the next presentation is by Dr. Uh, Vijay Singh Patel, uh, primary PCI in near fatal left main occlusion. And Dr. Patel is joining us from uh, Walkhart Hospital in Mumbai. Yeah, thank you so much, respected chairperson and moderators. Uh, uh, if you allow me now, uh, I would like to present two cases. And I sincerely uh, concur with all my fellow colleagues who have done an excellent job with their left main cases. But in my case, the choice of elective uh, use of imaging as well as the mechanical circulatory support were not available because they were on table crash. And they were probably uh, what we call is a bailout left main stenting. Both of these patients are doctors and they were from my institute only. And they have presented in the peak COVID times, both were the physician. Now this first case is a case of a 47 year physician who has directly rushed to the cath lab from his home with a 30 minute history of chest pain, cold peripheries, with unrecordable blood pressures, with a very feeble pulse, that is 60. Uh, obviously, so it was suspected to be an acute coronary syndrome and an echocardiography was ordered right uh, on, in the cath lab itself. But briefly in the past history, we also knew that this patient had a CVA, that was a cerebellar stroke with a left vertebral uh, dissection, dissection and occlusion. We came out of it very, very uh, you know, miraculously and completely. And uh, when we did his ECG, this was the ECG. Clearly, it was a uh, 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 left main occlusion uh, with a tall AVR with the ST depressions in the in inferior leads and a uh, hyperacute ST elevations in uh, mid precordial leads. The uh, quick screening of the echo, just to confirm, showed uh, LAD territory hypokinesia with a moderate mitral regurgitation an ejection fraction of around 30 to 35%. And this was the injection, right? Uh, we took a seven French femoral uh, axis with a seven JL guide. And that showed clearly a complete occlusion of the left main uh, right at the uh, distal uh, portion. And we thought it is a completely thrombotic occlusion. 
and the patient's blood pressure here was unrecordable. We had a very limited amount of time to take a decision. So in that uh, uh, hurry, we uh, one operator was ordered to start with a balloon pump from the contralateral side while uh, we started wiring this lesion with a balloon in already uh, on the wire. Wherever the wire went, but it actually saved the uh, patient's crash and uh, it uh, dislodged uh, a bit of thrombus from that. And with wire itself, we could see some sluggish flow in the, both the uh, CERC and the LAD. And we could see there was a tight distal left main stenosis and probably it was atherosclerotic stenosis. Uh, and then we uh, repositioned the wire after the first dilatation. Uh, uh, we uh, crossed the wire into the LAD. We did some... Uh, Balloon dilatation there, patient's uh, blood pressure started rising to around 40 millimeters. Herein, there was no choice but to do a stenting, uh, what we call it as a bailout left main stenting. And we decided that we will go ahead while the surgical team arrives, while the balloon pump was being prepared. And everything happened with, with uh, just four to five minutes. So we decided since it was uh, clearly a severely symptomatic patient with cardiogenic shock, severe metabolic acidosis, almost about to go on a ventilator. Uh, and uh, the patient was still conscious. So we decided that we will do a left main stent uh, with a crossover to LM to LAD. Uh, and we will see uh, subsequently later on if we uh, come face any problem. So this was the uh, first decision and we, uh, uh, we took a 3.5 into 36 millimeter um, uh, Evrolimus eluting stent. And it was placed from uh, almost mid shot of left main to the uh, LED covering the uh, proximal LED lesion completely. And uh, it was deployed at around 14 uh, atmospheric pressures. Uh, this actually uh, gave a wonderful rise in the blood pressure. Pressures were hovering around 90 millimeters of mercury. But we, we noticed now that this was a clearer injection, uh, which was seen for the first time. And it was showing clearly a diffusely distal LED disease, a diffuse disease in the circumflex territory. And mind you, we could not even take right coronary injection. Uh, of course, now since we have stented, we decided we'll optimize this LED properly. And we post dilated the LED part of the stent with a 408 uh, non-compliant balloon. We realized that this is causing another crash. We, uh, by this time, we wanted to take a pot for the LM, but we thought that we'll first place an intraortic balloon pump because he again started having hypotension. So first, uh, by this time, the contralateral side was, uh, groin was prepared and uh, IABP was in place. And once the IABP was in place, we decided we will take a 4.5 uh, eight uh, non-compliant balloon and we uh, inflated it to almost 20 atmosphere to optimize the left main uh, portion of the stent. And uh, that was a, a good result, fruitful result. Patient uh, was hemodynamically stable without even intubation if we could bail him out. He had some uh, con constant inotropic requirement for the next two to three days. But then he, he did uh, had a, a good recovery without any acute renal failure or any uh, sepsis. The right coronary was injected later after the procedure was over and it was a, a sort of dominant right coronary. So explaining why he had a, a, you know, a almost a safe sailing through that uh, intervention. Uh, so uh, this was the ECG post procedure, expectedly some circumflex slow flow uh, it was uh, managed with an ecorandil, but to a, to a great uh, uh, this thing that there was a significant improvement in the left ventricular ejection fraction and uh, uh, his LV had become almost near normal at discharge. So my take home from this case is clearly that acute total occlusion of the LMCA is a rare angiographic finding and presentation is usually catastrophic. Those who don't die in the acute phase of occlusion usually will have a dominant right coronary artery and extensive collateral of the left coronary. Primary PCI permits rapid reperfusion of the LMCA and certainly in a certain subset can be a better option than CABG. 
at the first medical contact, the occlusion of the LMC has to be suspected from the ECG and clinical presentation. And obviously two operators are always better. The teamwork will give you the uh, excellent result. IABP, yes, in such scenario can be life-saving. Uh, let me just also uh, share my next case, um, which is actually similar to this. And then we can have a, a panel discussion. This is another case of a 58 year doctor. He's a diabetic, four years, he's a hypertensive. He had a hyperlipidemia earlier and he had presented to a peripheral center with a extensive anterior wall myocardial infarction was immediately lies with metal eyes. And his uh, CAG, which was done almost uh, uh, f f six years ago, showed a double vessel disease. And there was no mention of any left man uh, disease in that. He had underwent the Evrolimus eluting stent to mid LED for 80% stenosis. That time his ejection fraction was 45%. This time he was uh, referred from an outside hospital after having thrombolyzed with a crescendo angina. Uh, the way he presented over there with a severe suffocation and shortness of breath, extensive interval MI, uh, again lies with connected place. And next day, since he had a recurrent angina, was referred to us. This was the ECG in our, in our hospital. And uh, uh, this was more or less suggestive of the same LED involvement. But the patient was anxious. He had an angina by stooping forward. Heart rate was around 98. Pressures were stable. One uh, blood pressure was 130 by 84. And uh, saturations uh, normal. You can see this ECG did not give any clue regarding left main. But uh, since it was only referred for a diagnostic catheterization, we uh, did, uh, uh, after doing an echo, which showed a severely compromised LV systolic dysfunction with an EF of 25% with mild MR, creat of 0.9. And this was his right coronary artery, showed a co-dominant circulation with osteal stenosis of around 70-80% with a damping of pressures. The left main uh, immediately showed suspicious osteal left main, and uh, there was a patent stent into the mid LED. And this was the second and the only injection we would uh, have. And this time we have already summoned the cath lab uh, for the help. And then second cardi uh, cardiologist was uh, summoned immediately. While we were explaining this patient, the need of urgent revascularization, the patient had collapsed and this was the next immediate fluoro patient had complete flush occlusion of the left main probably because of the dye irritation of or because of some dissection at the ostium there was absolutely no cardiac contractility and uh, cpr was started immediately uh, there was some injection uh, possible at the end of the cpr you can see there were no flow going through the left main into the either of the uh, led or lcx concluding that there was a complete occlusion of the left main at the ostium itself. We had only the radial axis and uh, definitely uh, we did not have any clue from the ECG, but then we realized that it would have been a better to have a femoral axis. But since there was already a radial axis in place, we took a jail uh, six strange guide catheter while the patient was resuscitated. Uh, there was uh, since the immediately we could give some intracardiac adrenaline diluted and the rhythm could be restarted within one or two minutes. A blind wiring was done uh, with wire was going somewhere into the, uh, I think it was a high uh, obtuse marginal, but we, uh, we continued the CPR balloon uh, immediately dilated at the left main ostium and uh, uh, intracardiac adrenaline was repeated some uh, rhythmic contraction started. We had a pressure of around 60 millimeters and then wire was repositioned again from the OM to the LED. We did dilate this again uh, with a 2.5 into 10 non-compliant balloon, thinking that it will be a fibrotic lesion. Patient, patient again had a hemodynamic uh, crash after the second dilatation requiring uh, uh, intracardiac adrenaline, intracoronary. Uh, epinephrine. Second wire was placed in the left circumflex. We, uh, we, 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 we took a stent. Uh, it was a 3-0 into 28 
uh, Evrolimus polymer stent, which was from the left main ostium to the mid LED stent with the overlap. And this was deployed at 18 atmosphere. Uh, uh, after this dilatation, again, the patient had a collapsed, uh, but uh, immediately improved after uh, the uh, adrenaline and uh, uh, I think it, uh, Nicorandel. The patient uh, improved subsequently. There was a part done to the LM ostium with a 4O balloon. Uh, patient had a good TM3 flow at the end. We uh, obviously we are following this patient uh, with the serial angiography uh, in the coming uh, one or two months uh, to see uh, because we have not done any imaging whatsoever for the optimization of the LM stent. Uh, again, uh, by this time, the pressure though have improved, uh, the IABP was not still in place. We placed the elective IABP after the procedure. We knew that this may or may not help, but then subsequently, since the patient was intubated, we had a borderline pressure, IABP gave us a good pressure and uh, the urine output uh, was better. This was the ECG post-procedure. He was electively ventilated for two days. IBP was weaned off by 48 hours. He required broad spectrum antibiotics. Luckily, no CNS damage. Good urine output maintained. Uh, some uh, complication intra, uh, you know, in the intraoperative, postoperative period with the infection. But he was uneventfully discharged uh, at the end of seven days. For me, the teaching point again is a, a primary PCI in left main in a selective cases could uh, be uh, definitely a uh, rescuing. Most of these cases who are already thrombolized, uh, we, we can definitely restore the patency of the IRA with uh, uh, plasti to that culprit. Uh, again, the same uh, important teaching point of a sign to heaven that is AVR lead elevation in a myocardial infarction should be taken with a, a always pinch of salt. And this patient has to be uh, aggressively managed in the beginning. The prompt revascularization was a key in this case. Patient uh, was saved out of the hemodynamic collapse due to this rescue bailout LMCI intervention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, respected colleagues and teachers. Well, those were some phenomenal cases, Dr. Patel. Definitely some very, uh, uh, like your talk rightfully said, um, you know, back from the dead uh, kind of cases. Um, and. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, one thing. Let me let me just start the discussions. You know, you we and we. I'm not talking just about left main, but in in all these cases of yours, where there's thrombus, um, especially in the first case, and also to a certain extent in the second case, when there's thrombus, I, what are your thoughts and what are the panel? Are, are you guy? Are you using thrombectomy? Are you using thrombectomy catheter? Um, you know, uh, are we still doing that? Yeah, Dr. though the thrombectomy catheters has been downgraded in the recent literature, but it's not an absolute contraindication. In such situations where the left main is huge, LED is huge, we can use it. You know, it's up to the observer. And better to use intracoronary, you know, some apsiximab with some 12 hours infusion. And I think he has done an excellent job in both the situations. And uh, we should put the IABP at the outset. You know, we shouldn't delay putting the outset in such situations. And immediately we should put an R because when the patient will go downhill, we don't know about it. And the problem starts when you go for repeated, you know, balloon inflations. But you know, it's mandatory because LED and left main are different, uh, you know, caliber arteries. So we have to go for the balloon dilatation. But you saw that the patients had a beautiful, you know, flow in the LED TM3 plus. But you know, as soon as we had a balloon dilatation of the proximal LED and the left main to have the proper size, the, there was slow flow, there was hemodynamic deterioration and everything had to be done. So that's the problem, you know. So in these patients, we have to go for it because we have to achieve the size, proper size of the left main. Uh, but that there lies the problem that in one teaching is that therefore, that in acute MI, where possible, we should avoid repeated balloon dilatation, even pre-dilatation. I go for direct stenting. I don't dilate the, I don't go for dilatation. I don't go for dilatation. I go for a prolonged dilatation. You do some plus minus during the first dilatation. You go for a long inflation, not for the left main, of course, but as a whole. And we should avoid 
balloon inflation as much as possible. There occurs the dispersion, but you can use the you know thrombectomy catheter show me. You know, there is no contraindication as such. Yeah, I, I know it's, it's all this thing, Dr. Ramnathan. How would you do this in Chennai? I mean, you 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 accomplished uh, uh, this thing, operated Dr. Ramnathan. You're one of the panelists. Yes, sir. Yeah, I uh, fully uh, agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Diman, sir. Uh, I think the, both these cases are were excellent. It's both were life saving, and uh, all of us uh, learned a lot. The uh, almost we use the same uh, protocols. Uh, the one important thing in left main is to, as sir was telling, to establish the flow as early as possible. Though thrombectomy catheters we use, uh, I mean, depending on the duration of the thrombus and the amount of thrombus in LAD, LCX. In left main, many times we won't have time to put a wire to do the thrombosuction, get it, no. Patient crashes immediately. So at the outset, if possible, put an IABP. The number one yeah. thing which the moment I see the patient, I call for help. Though all of us can do individually, we have to have one more or two more cardiologists in the cath lab. It helps us a lot. It, it reduces the stress for the patient, I mean, for us particularly, and it helps the patient in a very, very big way. And number two, you engage it, put a pass a wire, get a dilatation. Though most of the times acute MIs, we do a direct stenting also, particularly in young people. Whatever we have seen in left minds, I don't know. I have not uh, done any direct uh, dilatation, I mean, uh, direct stenting in left mind because we don't know whether it was a thrombus or over the atherosclerosis, whatever. So at least with a small balloon, the moment you get a flow, the hemodynamics improve. Then you can have your time, take a decision and go for a stenting. Because once you put a stent in a completely uh, more of a fibrotic or atherosclerotic part, sometimes it may not open fully, particularly in left main, we need to have a, I mean, good optimization. So uh, apart from these things, uh, I mean, whatever sir said, it is, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And uh, regarding the previous, these things also, uh, putting a catheter, it helps us a lot, particularly in left, because the patient will be, uh, itching for urine to pass, that we are, again increases the stress. So we do put a catheter, we do uh, have a IABP in case patients' hemodynamics are borderline. And number three, always keep the pressures high. Even the pressures are 100, 110, 120, we start a small dose of dopamine if needed. Uh, I mean, uh, some other inotropes also to keep the pressure high because you know the moment you inflate, the pressures are going to drop. And number three, in no flow situations with hypotension, I feel the only drug what we have is intracoronary adenoid. I think he has, uh, the presenter has uh, told uh, extensively and it helps us really a lot. And intracoronary abscissimab, if time permits, before stenting, if we give, we feel the chances of slow flow is slightly less yeah. after the stenting. These are the and points it has been shown in the literature also that it is not less effective than you know this aspiration. So and I didn't I didn't mean yeah, that. I told also that in sizing the left main we have to go for the post dilatation in some cases pre dilatation also. But we should avoid ballooning as much as possible because yeah. that causes the dispersion of the thrombus distally and yeah. causes slow flow, no flow, and all the hemodynamic downfall. I just have one question yeah, to the all the panelists. Sorry, if I'm taking time. So now regarding the guide catheter selection between EB and the JL, I just wanted the opinions about, I mean, with all the masters here. See, actually routinely I take EBU, but uh, when you suspect left main, it is safer to take, I think, I mean, uh, JL. Yeah. I mean, because you don't know that, I mean, the size of the, I mean, uh, the length of the left main and the nature of the left main is not uh, known. If suppose if it's a short yeah. left main, then you won't have any space between the tip of the catheter and the lesion. So I think uh, JL is more safer. Uh, and uh, see, in most of the cases in left main, you may not need, a, 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 I mean, extra support also. And especially in acute MI setup. Suppose if you're planning for a bifurcation, which uh, has got a lot of calcium, yeah. And difficulties, probably you need a good backup. Otherwise, I think uh, jail is a safer and uh, a quicker one. And another important thing regarding to this case, which I would like to mention is see, timing. Time is the most important thing in, in, when you consider such a cases. I should, we should appreciate that Dr. Patil actually, he saved the lives actually. These are, the, these are called the life-saving cases. See, even one minute or few seconds are very important. The first thing is you gain the flow. 
then everything else is second. See, if you call for help, call for the anesthetist, call for the next cardiologist, everything. And meanwhile, you get a catheter and put a wire and introduce a balloon. And at least a doctoring by a balloon is a must. Then once you get a flow, then you can think of all other options. And uh, I, I think we should appreciate that he put uh, IABP for the second case after completing the case. Even that is also very useful. Sometimes, you know, when, uh, see, this is a left main occlusion, so patient uh, myocardium must have had some stunning and so many other uh, problems. So even if you have completely successfully done the procedure, if the BP is on the low side, and then definitely IABP will help to improve, not only to improve the uh, blood pressure, but also to improve the coronary perfusion. So that is more important than improving the blood pressure. I and think, I, I, uh, yeah. It, it's just like this, which really, you know, make you sleep at night. You know, yeah, I've done my, I've done my exactly. for the, you know, the cardiology, cardiology thing. And the world is also now going towards the door to loading time, right? I mean, now the recent uh, Jack publication about early use of ECMO, early use of impella, early use of mechanical circulatory devices. So that's also the, you know, you're going towards the door to and door to unloading time. I think good discussion. Probably yeah, so, you can proceed uh, with the next case. I think right? let's, let's move on to the next presenter. Yes. Yes, 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 sir. Uh, so the next, the next presenter is, uh, the, the, the topic is left. Um, the next uh, presentation is by Dr. Arindam Pandey, uh, who's joining us from uh, the Medical Super Specialty Hospital, and is going to be left main step by step. <clears throat> Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so at the outset, I'd like to thank my previous presenter showing wonderful cases. So left main is very important because many a time we think left main probably it's very easy to do. And even myself, I consider doing a CTO and doing a left main, probably left main, it is procedure wise, easier procedure. But the problem is in left main, you cannot, you are not allowed to do even a very, very simple mistakes because otherwise the patient can die on table. So all the beginners, the newcomers who are starting Lepman cases, I think they should start by selecting a proper case. I think to start with either a Lepman osteal or sept, mid sept cases or a protected Lepman sort of cases is ideal to beginning, begin the Lepman cases. Then after gaining some experience, yes, you can do com more complex cases. So I'll briefly touch upon a very simple case, which I did yesterday only. This is a very simple case and the patient was discharged just I am coming after discharging the patient. So he was a 74 year old gentleman post CAVG 10 years back refractory angina and you revealed two grafts were patent Lima to LED and SVG to RCA but occluded SVG to OM. So he was taken for a radial PCI LMCA to LCA. This is a very simple case uh, to be honest the beginner's case and as I, I, I could not gather the IVAS uh, images. I'll only show the uh, angiographic images. This is the lesion we can see. This is radial root EBO guiding catheter because left main was quite long. Uh, so I was listening to the discussion whether we should choose a uh, EBU or JL. But in this kind of left main where left main is very, very long, you can choose EBO as well. I think panelists will agree with me. So this is the lesion and I'm not showing all these steps. Proper predilection was done, 2.5 millimeter balloon distally and proximally uh, 3 millimeter NC balloon. And distal IVAS image showed that the artery was that of around 3 millimeter, but LCX ostium was around 4 millimeter. And the left main was 5 millimeters. It's very important to get an idea of imaging so that we can choose the proper stent size and where we are supposed to put the stent. So distal stent was a 3 into 28 millimeter uh, YCP stent. And we can see the distal land landing zone is healthy. And proximally, we strategically kept the stent at the ostium of left main. It's very important because 
we cannot give a very high diameter stent deep inside the LC. And the you can see the proximal stent was from the mid shaft to the LCX. So that is how it was done. And then serial post dilatation. And this was the final result you can see. So radial angioplasty, one day hospital stay and I just discharged him today. So second case is this 80 year old lady, unstable angina, ejection fraction 50%, global hypokinesia, presented with ongoing chest pain, drop eye was borderline elevated 0.76. And as she was very elderly, frail kind of lady, we thought whatever we are going to do, we'll do by coronary intervention only, angioplasty only. She was not a candidate for bypass, so it was all planned. So right coronary artery was normal. LCX, there was some moderate, moderate lesion. And we can see the left main disease. Calcium starting up sort of block of calcium in the left main, distal left main with all the LAD, which is extremely calcified vessel. And you can see the lesion, it's very tight, the LAD proximal portion. So first difficulty in this case, as I already mentioned, patients, relative everybody was where comes counsel and they agreed for angioplasty only. So bypass was not an option. The first difficulty with which I had in this case is to wear this LAD. So there was some tiny ramus kind of thing, which every time the wire was going to the ramus. So what I did, I did some modification. I took a micro catheter, gave a 180 degree curve to a Xion blue. And by doing that only, I could wear the LAD. So this was taken through femoral axis, again, a EBU and seven French, seven French EBU femoral. So this is the LAD, we can see, we can appreciate the amount of calcification. And the lesion was so tight that initially I could not negotiate the IVAS catheter. So I had to pre-dilate with a two millimeter New York semi-compliant balloon. And after that only I could negotiate my IVAS catheter. And the IVAS uh, pullback, we can see the distal, mid distal LAD is somehow healthy. And as we come back, more proximally, there are some speckles of calcification which are visible at this point at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, then it is getting more tighter and tighter. And the calcification also is getting more dense. And very interestingly, we can see the intimal calcification at this portion and other portion you can see there are definite medial calcification at one o'clock, two o'clock, and three o'clock. So both intimal as well as medial calcification and very tight lesion in spite of predilatation with a two millimeter semi-compliant balloon, the lesion was very, very tight. This is the LED. We can see almost 360 degree calcification, very tight. And the measurement was uh, distal uh, LED was three millimeter, LED ostium was four millimeter and left main was five millimeter and 5.5 millimeter to at some places, the proximal part. So I'm going to further. So we thought we'd, we'd take a IVL to crack the calcium because both intimal as well as medial calcification, as we all know, uh, rotablation is fantastic for cracking the intimal calcification, but for medial calcification, it, it is not that effective. It is not effective, to be honest. Now, as there was significant medial calcification as well in my case, so I choose the IVL. And IVL, everybody knows by this time, uh, four catheter size balloon catheters are available, 2.5 to 4. And we are supposed to give a one to one, you know, uh, dilatation with this kind of catheter. So that is very, very ideal. But in this kind of situation where we are planning to do left main as well as LAD, so choosing a proper size of catheter is very important. Now, if your economy is not a problem, finance is not a problem, you should ideally choose a couple of IVL catheter, one for LAD and another for left main, because there is definite discrepancy of size. But in our case, we did have financial issues. So we choose only one catheter, three millimeter, and we, we can see uh, how we are giving the IVL burst in the LAD, then in the left main, see, this is the left main IVL. And in spite of giving 80 burst, 
we thought probably more bursts could have been helpful, but as we all know, maximum 80 bursts can be given. And post IVL angio was not very promising. So we decided to take non-compliant balloon, two non-compliant new York balloon, distally three and proximally 3.5 millimeter non-compliant balloon. We used then only after using a proper, even after IVL, we took you know, proper pre-dilatation with non-compliant balloon. Then the lesion actually opened up. We took stents, a couple of stents. Distal one was three by 32. They were ultimaster stents. And there was not much a problem in negotiating the stent. And we inflated the stent with the distal stent. And we took proximal stent. It was four by 18 millimeter up to the left main. And this is how you're doing it. And then serial post dilatation, distally 3.5, then another new post dilatation balloon, non-compliant 4.5. And we took, I think around 10, 12 balloon in this case. And this is the final NG, I was run. The LED stent coming to the left main. And there was not much a problem. And this was the final NG result. Lady was very elderly. We did it around one year back and she's doing quite good. No engine at all, comes for regular follow-up. That's it. Thank you very much. Once again, some terrific kids uh, on the great work. Uh, any comments from any of the uh, yeah excellent the case or any Thank you. very dynamic cardiologist and have done the case fantastic way. Thank uh, you. Sir. The exposition of the subject, your sizing, and your uh, you know it was a heavily calcified lesion. Not I should not tell heavily. It was a moderately calcified lesion, and you have done it extremely well. So can you tell a little bit of the details of the IVL what you have done over there? Yes, sir. I think that instead of rota, you chose uh, IVL because yeah, it's I... convenient, the complications are less. We know about it. But what is your impression that uh, we, uh, instead of rota, why did you choose? We are going for IVL nowadays frequently. But what were your points for choosing IVL? Very nicely done. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, uh, most important point you already mentioned uh, the Chances of complication, it has been proved in different, different studies that it is far, far lesser with IVL. And this was an eight-year-old frail lady. So this was very important point for choosing IVL over rotablation. Now, second point, which I'd like to stress upon is the presence of medial calcification. As the rotablation, it is not effective for you know approaching the medial calcification. It can only do whatever the cracking is in, in the intimal calcification because nowadays we are not choosing rota bar more than 1.75. So two millimeter rota bar we are not using nowadays. Mostly we are using the smaller size rota bar to crack the calcium. Then we are using post dilatation, pre dilatation non-compliant balloon. So in this case, there was significant medial calcification as well. So that is another reason for choosing a IVL over rotablation in my case. My one concern about this That's is like points. when we use- uh, There are a couple of questions which just come up on the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. See, Mustafa, I'll, 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 why don't you answer this question which has come up in the chat? Yeah, sure. There are two questions we have over here. Yeah, what is uh, From our audiences. Uh, the question is, if you're doing, uh, and this question was actually, we talked about it earlier also. If you're doing uh, a radial in short left main, uh, EBU should not be uh, should be avoided as control is not good, especially in real access. And uh, that is the point that somebody is trying to make, and we talked about that earlier. Uh, the second point is in left main uh, coronary artery uh, occlu total occlusion, which is the priority? Getting an IABP in position of wiring and pre dilating balloons to get no, no. some. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is very clear. Actually, that I can speak from my own experience. It's always a highly debatable, uh, I mean, uh, question like whether you have to open the left main or put an IAPB. But from my opinion, you have to open the vessel first. That's the first thing. IAPB and all thing is secondary because unless you open, whether you put an IAPB is not going to help. 
but first thing is the culprit you have to open the i mean this thing ideally speaking first thing you should open and another second cardiologist should do it parallelly but if you don't have the time but you should always give the priority for uh, opening the vessel especially in left main unless you open the vessel the patient is going to crash and again the time is also very important and sometimes if you have difficulty see suppose you are doing uh, the radial procedure and if you have uh, too much of difficulty in negotiating the catheter and all that immediately i think you should switch over to femoral so that it will give you more space and uh, uh, i mean probably you should be able to do it uh, faster so that is uh, about that yeah yeah dr samir that, uh, dr samir i think ibp is overhyped because it does not lead to more than i think 500 cc output so i don't know why we are so much concerned about ibp i mean putting ibp first you have to open the artery and in case i mean you can afford impel is a better choice yeah yeah so improve improve flow is is the you know that we all know like improve improve flow and uh, that's the first thing and then whatever marginal benefit we can get from iabp versus uh, you know whether you want to go iabp plus ecmo or impella or then the you, you go up the escalation pattern you know we are running really short on time we have about 35 minutes and we have four presentations so uh, i think we should go ahead with the next presentation Uh, if that's okay, uh, it's going to be optimizing PCI for distal left main coronary artery bifurcation disease by Dr. Chirag Seth. Uh, Dr. Chirag Seth is joining us from the Rhythm Hospital in Baroda. He's the director and chief interventional cardiologist over there. Dr. The Seth. Yeah. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, uh, respected chairpersons, panelists. Uh, straight away starting with the my case as we are also running short of the time uh, optimizing pci of uh, distal left main bifurcation stenosis so uh, my patient is a 57 year old male who is diabetic who has undergone prior angioplasty with regurgitating stent to led for acute coronary syndrome one and half year back it was zions 2.75 into 48 which was uh, uh, deployed from ostium of the led and now after about one and a half year he is now presented with new onset of angina and a strongly positive treadmill his ejection fraction was normal so if you, if we look at the angiogram uh, it shows that uh, this is the picture a critical distal left main stenosis involving uh, origins of uh, led and circumflex it is medina 111 the right coronary artery was normal and it was a distal uh, uh, left main stenosis so uh the a heart team discussion uh, ultimately uh, cabg and pci both options were given and uh, considering syntax score and detailed discussion pci was opted for so uh, i'll not go through the detailed ivas run here these are the snapshots of uh, led in uh, ivas imaging uh, a is proximal and f is distal and we can see that uh, the distal uh, reference diameter of led was almost uh, 3 mm the stent was 2.75 into 48 deployed into the led right from the ostium and we can clearly see that uh, the stent is well opposed but it has got under expansion there is not much of uh, 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 instant restenosis and uh, at the ostium also the stent appears to be around 2.75 mm in the diameter so it was under deployed stent well opposed without much of instant restenosis uh, the left main was about 5.5 to 6 mm in diameter uh, with minor with minor yeah. disease and proximal circumflex yeah. was around 5 to 5.5 mm uh, in diameter with minor disease yeah. in the pro proximal part uh, acha so uh, yeah. Initially, Achha. we proceeded with uh, yeah. pre-dilatation of uh, both uh, LED and circumflex with uh, uh, respectively with three and three point five millimeter yeah. dilation. What happened? 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 What so after pre dilatation of both led and circumflex ostium uh, with 3 and 3.5 mm dilatation balloon uh, it took a promus elite 4 into 32 mm stent deployed from uh, circumflex uh, left main ostium into the circumflex a crossover from lmca to lcx and then it was optimized with nc emerge 5.5 mm into 8 mm in the left circumflex and 6 into 8 mm uh, at at 18 atmospheric pressure uh, in the left main after that uh, the strand the first spot was done in lmca with nc emerge 6 into 8 mm at 18 atmosphere thereafter led was rewired 
stent studs were dilated with 3.5 millimeter balloon and uh, 3.5 millimeter balloon in left main and uh, proximal circumflex about uh, 5.5 millimeter balloon simultaneous kissing balloon dilatations were done afterwards uh, we chose uh, since the stent was uh, under expanded into led we optimized the led result and thereafter we used a drug eluting balloon 3.5 to 28 millimeter magic touch followed by kissing balloon dilatation using the same magic touch balloon as well as uh, nc balloon 5.5 to 8 millimeter into the circumflex and uh, subsequent to this again did a repot in lmc with 6 into 8 millimeter and uh, subsequent to that this was the final result obtained with a well opposed stent and a good tme3 flow in both the vessels and this was the final result if you look into the final i was snapshots uh, lmc had uh, shown almost a very good opposition with a, a uh, uh, a good stent position. Uh, the uh, the uh, minimal luminal area at LED ostium was about 10.65, and into the proximal circumflex about 15.67, and uh, polygon of confluence also showing good areas. So, uh, learning points are that imaging provided here insights into mechanism of proximal edge dystenosis, and it must be an integral part in managing these patients with PCI. Imaging simplified stent size selection based on vessel diameter and also approach to PCI. And correction of under expansion with drug eluting balloon instead of putting another desk could be an attractive option in patients with age restenosis to avoid multiple metal layers at these crucial sites like LMCA. A brief uh, uh, case, uh, second case was a 29 year old male who was recently detected diabetic, had acute anterior wall ST elevation MI with ejection fraction 35%, was admitted for primary PCI. And there was a flush occlusion of uh, LED ostium, and uh, right coronary artery had shown minor plaques with uh, grade two retrograde collaterals. Cranial views had shown left main to be plaquey. We had taken right femoral axis, JL 3.57F guide. Uh, plan was to consider whether one should put ostial versus crossover stent. So, uh, plain balloon dilatation at 2 into 12 millimeter at ostium. And subsequently, this was the picture after uh, getting anti grade flow into the LED. And we can clearly see here that distal left main has a plaque. And uh, it will be difficult to really uh, put the stent at ostium and it would end into the plaque only. And that would uh, understandably produce higher risk of mace rates in future. Uh, I was had shown that osteoproximal left main was not showing any, any disease and it was free of disease. Distal left main had around 50% plaque, fibrolipidic, and a proximal LED, osteoproximal LED had significant fibrolipidic plaque, and the area was around, uh, and the vessel size was around 4 to 4.5 uh, 4 millimeter of uh, 4.5 millimeter. Uh, proximal circumflex had shown less than 40% plaque, and uh, we decided that uh, let us have a provisional kind of approach. After uh, balloon dilatation, we put an Ultimaster Tensai 4 into 24 millimeter crossover from left, mid left main to LED, avoided the stented osteoproximal left main. And uh, we did leave a sufficient amount of uh, stent in left main for pot. And uh, this was a stent positioning. And uh, stent was deployed at proximal LED, appeared to be a little under deployed, and therefore it was optimized again with NC balloon 4 into 12 at 22 atmosphere. Thereafter, pot was done at 4.5 to 8 millimeter at 18 atmosphere atmospheric pressure. And after pot, uh, circumflex was rewired. And uh, kissing balloon dilatation with 4.5 millimeter balloon in LED and 275 into 12 millimeter in LCX was done. And thereafter, again, a second pot uh, with 5 into 6 millimeter balloon at 18 atmospheric pressure. And this was the final result. So this is cranial view this in the caudal view and this was the end result and uh, the final uh, left main area was around 20 uh, millimeter square led ostium 9.5 and l6 ostium 5.85 millimeter square so in a young patient diabetic anterior wall mi low ejection fraction i was guidance favored crossover stent approach i was helped sparing lmc ostium and provisional stenting of bifurcation, left main bifurcation worked in this patient. Thank you for the patient here. Once again, a great case, uh, Dr. Seth. Um, you know, a lot of use of imaging, and you know, imaging definitely comes in very handy and helpful. Um, so these complex cases. Uh, yeah. I just want to invite the panel, uh, Dr. Ramanathan, if you have any view, any uh, 
uh, any comments of any of the other uh, Dr. Mustafa? Yeah, uh, Dr. Shirag, I just have a doubt. Like, how do you choose the uh, size of the, I mean, post dilatation balloon for kissing, the, the, the final kissing balloon, you know, like for the lady and uh, LCX? Yeah. How do you, I mean, uh, decide upon the size? I mean, uh, it has to be as per the vessel size, one is to one dilatation and NC balloons. One is to one. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Using then, then how much you pro, I mean, protrude it into the left main actually? Yeah, you, you, I mean, you would like to protrude it, uh, I mean, like into the left main, how much? Minimum Almost about uh, like... maybe, uh, three, yeah, I mean, uh, at least three to four millimeter, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I know, like it's uh, it's uh, always our practice, like to uh, use uh, one is to one, even I used to do that, but always yeah. my back of my mind, I will have a fear, like, is it going to cause some trouble for the distal left main? When you protrude too no. much into the, uh, what is your uh, view about that? Like, no, no, it, it, I, I, I don't think in my relatively limited experience, I don't think we have a problem at this level. I think, I think probably for your first case, I think you used a 5.5 millimeter for the LCX, yes. right? Yes, 5.5 millimeter. 3.5. Yes. Almost like a nine millimeter balloon Correct. is in the left main, Correct. distal left Correct. main. So I was just. Correct. Yes. But most in of fact, that yeah. is one of the questions. There is another question that came up on the chat. Which balloon is available in six millimeter diameter for pose irritation? It is. It is NC Emerge. It's from Boston. Yeah, it's, I think usually it is not there in the shelf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, yeah. To, we need to keep it. We need to keep it in lab. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Chirag, hi, hi. This is Dr. Omar. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Omar. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to know if uh, for how long did you inflate that deb in the proximal LED? Uh, two, two, two minutes, I think, as that is what uh, the, the, the recommendation is when you put a uh, dab into the LED. Yeah. I mean, wherever we employ, yeah. Great. So, and uh, did the patient tolerate that ischemia time for two minutes? Yes. Yes. Uh, 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 yes, he tolerated. It was a normal LV ejection fraction uh, 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 shown here. And the patient did tolerate it well. Great, great. Fantastic cases, both of them. Great. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Chirag, Thank are there you. any concerns about using yeah. imaging after you are using a dab in a vessel? So do you really need to do imaging, I mean, or to cross uh, with other devices once uh, DMA? I, mean, I, I, I agree, but I think uh, my per, the, the concern with this patient was it was under expanded stent, which we had to optimize. And therefore we had to really document what really we are doing with this. Again, the stent was put one and a half year back. It was Zions. So we were, uh, uh, I mean, with the optimization, did it really work? Did we achieve the diameter? That was the reason we had to document that uh, what is the final uh, MLA is achieved. Just one quick comment there. Um, uh, yeah. I, where generally, when we are using a DEB and uh, we need to do imaging, so generally what I do is I first uh, optimize the size with a normal NC balloon. Uh, and then uh, when the size, have, have, we have achieved the size on uh, imaging, and then we do a final DEB for two minutes and then take everything out with the final shot. Just, just the device. Yeah, yeah. It. Correct. Very pragmatic I, I approach. Got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Amar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the right approach, I would. Yeah. I think let's try and carry on. I'm sorry, but I think we should uh, carry on. Uh, the next case is by Dr. Sunil Vani, OCD guided PCI. And uh, Dr. Vani is joining us from Kokila Band Hospital in Mumbai. Dr. Vani? I don't see Dr. Vani over here. Um, is Dr. Anuj Sarda here? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Sarda. Do you want, uh, till the time I think uh, Dr. Vani got disconnected, if you want to take over and continue um, on Why your not? 11th hour complication. And uh, uh, Dr. Sarda is joining us from Tat uh, Ayu Hospital in Nagpur. Yes. Uh, should I start, sir? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, after so many left main, this is a, another case of left main with complications. So that's why I've kept my uh, topic, actually the 11th hour complication. I just nick of the time I had a, this complication. Uh, in summary, a 67-year-old male with interval MI with moderate LV dysfunction, diabetic, Ex-smoker on optimal medical treatment and underwent angiogram. And uh, the angiogram showed distal left mean 80% stenosis 
LED ostium is 90% stenosis and mid of the LED is 100% recent occlusion as I have thought initially to start with. And circumflex osteal, it's a borderline 50-60% lesion and the RCA shows a proximal plaque. So in view of this much of complex uh, condition with diabetic status, we have given definitely the first choice of CABG and second option we have kept reserved for the multivessel PCR. So uh, the, and this is the angiogram in detail. And uh, this is the angiogram in the cranial view. This shows the uh, uh, LED is 100% occluded at the mid part. As a relative, uh, they uh, opt for the uh, uh, angioplasty. So uh, at the, on the next day, we have planned this case. Initially, we have tried with Renato, but we, we failed with our workhorse wire. And then we tried with the Pilot 150. We have crossed with that and serially dilated with 1.25 and 2 and 2.5 NC track. These are the results with 2.5 NC track. And simultaneously, I have dilated with 2.512 the ostium of the uh, LED also. This is uh, the result uh, with the post dilatation. So I have thought it's better to start a stenting from the distal part. So I have taken 2.5 into 30 uh, stent at 12 atmospheric pressure. And the mid part with covered with 2.75 into 38 at 16 atmospheric pressure. So and we have post dilated uh, this part with 3 into 12 and 3.5 uh, in, uh, into 15 NC track. Now, this is the time, the main uh, time, uh, the main part uh, I have to take care at this point of time. Uh, the dilatation of the proximal LED uh, this uh, we did by means of 3.5 balloon. And at the same time, what we have realized. The, this is uh, this time there is a significant lesion at the LCF, LCX ostium. So I thought it's better to tackle this first and then think for the LED ostium. And already I'm dealing with a case of uh, um, uh, LED uh, interval MI. So it's better to first uh, take care of uh, circumflex. That's why at the 11th hour, first I have changed my strategy from left main to LED crossover to uh, uh, tap one. So uh, we have deployed 3.518 DS from left main to circumflex. And we did the POBA, uh, with, uh, we did the pot uh, with 4.5 into 6 with AQ force at 18 atmospheric pressure. Now we rewired the LED and dilated with 1.5 into 12 and 2 into 15 sprint uh, serially. And, uh, and we put a 3.518 DS in LED by means of tap technique. We usually uh, put a tap under the guidance of uh, stand boost. And this is what the final result with final kissing balloon with 3.5 into 18 and 3 into 15 NC in circumflex. And and these were the result after the uh, tap and final kissing. And particularly at this point, and particularly this area of the osteal uh, LED, let's look under expanded. So I thought it's better to expand it first. So for this, as a, uh, it's a 3.5 mm uh, stent, so we have taken a 4 into 9 AccuForce balloon for the dilatation of uh, the osteal LED. So as I have already deformed the stent at the circumflex, so it's better to correct the deformation. So again, we did a final kissing uh, with 3.5 into 12 and 3 into 15 track in circumflex. Actually, this endeavor cost us loss. At this point of time, the balloon, which uh, was there in circumflex 3 into 15, refused to deflate. And uh, initially, I have tried with a gentle pressure tuck and repeated inflation and deflation techniques and all in hurry because the, the, this is an important vessel, non-infarct uh, related vessel, but that is all in vain. And by this time, the patient had a significant chest pain at rest list. And uh, in emergency, I have given a hard tuck to that and balloon came out by the uh, circumflex and uh, all across the left main strength. 
and this lead to the longitudinal compression and it's most probably it's because of the push and pull of the guide uh, when uh, when i have given a hard tuck and this lead to the deformation of the left main stenting uh, of the left main area so initially i tried to correct with 4.5 into nc hq force but still there is some deformation is still there so we are not pretty much comfortable with that so i have thought it's better to correct by means of uh, sorry by means of another stent that uh, we have put another stent of 4 into 9 ds uh, across the left main from uh, ostial left main to uh, the distal part of the left main and post dilated with 4 0.5 into 6 nc at 12 atmospheric pressure and these were the final results with tme3 flow so conclude my case sometime complication may arise due to the malfunctioning of the balloon and things may go haywire be ready and watch for particularly in left main ostium and shaft intervention thank you sir Great case. Uh, yeah. Uh, presence of mind and uh, when these complications happen in a left main case in a non-infarct related body, it certainly uh, it becomes a challenge and you put in a stiffer. Um, so, uh, uh, any any comments from the panelists or? Uh, First of all, a fantastic case. Well done. So it's a beautiful case and very well done. And I was looking at the different steps. There was nothing, just junk. You know, when you started the angiogram. and thereafter you have done a marvelous job and it's really a problem if the i think the balloon was a uh, you know ox balloon i think no no sir uh, what i have made a dictum in my current practice whenever do uh, particularly the left main cases or left main distal bifurcation always always use a new or a new or old balloon otherwise it is possible sometimes you have to tell ox balloon you know <laughs> yeah. so try to avoid but sometimes if the finance is poor we have to take yeah okay that's good so it was a ny balloon but balloon it was in the circumflex it's a 3 3 into 15 balloon sir ah sir no no which track, which balloon track, track sir okay okay but very nicely done congratulations onu excellent thank you sir well thank done you. I you have managed everything. Uh, I know. So how points. is the patient doing now? How is the patient doing now? He's fine. Uh, and he, uh, we have done a repeat angiogram after six months as a surveillance, and because of my interest, academic interest, we did the angiogram, and uh, all is flowing well. No event of any restenosis, and uh, I thought any because of there are the two stent I put in left main. That is my biggest concern in this case. But at the six month follow up, he is doing fine, sir. Okay, fine. I know, Excellent. Uh, I know two three points. Uh, uh, in the left main or left main distal, where is the tight stenosis and ostial LED and LCX, they are fibrotic lesions. So it's better to take in such cases. You can go with the cutting balloon and cut the uh, tissues so that you get a better result. Because in the left main uh, LED ostium, uh, you said it is under expanded stent, and afterwards when you try to open it, even with a higher Pressure balloon it doesn't open up, so proper preparation of bed is very much necessary. So usually when we do such ostial cases, we use cutting balloon and we cut the tissue, the fibrotic tissue at the ostium of the LCX and all this. Uh, second thing is like uh, when you were not able to take out the balloon, uh, rapid inflation and deflation uh, could have helped you out in. Uh, deflating the balloon second is you can do at a high pressure and rupture the balloon also if there is no air but make sure that there is no air that is also one of the methods and then sometimes you like pull the balloon can break some things can happen like you said the patient had a andrium all mi isn't it so why did you take the patient on the next day because of left main intervention it's better uh, whenever you have given a choice of cbg it, it's a 78 uh, 78 uh, days oh, case that's why whenever you want to do a case it's better not to do a ad hoc uh, it was a old 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 mi you said 7 days old 78 days old mi stable uh, on optimal medical treatment that's why we have given a time and uh, legally it's also in that way it's correct it's better you should not take such patient as a ad hoc 
and uh, we have tried no, the this is a, see this is a emergency if you are saying its patient is a antrival mi then it's a no, emergency no, whether there is a left mean here to open the primary. vessel it's not a primary angioplasty it's a just a, a, a angioplasty it's a secondary angioplasty okay the, then the issues issues regarding viability all all this come patient patient is having a post mi angina all these things they come but okay yes, done very, very nicely nicely done case yes. Uh, uh, sir, I have mentioned everything in my history. He is presented to me with a post my angina, with recurrent angina. That's why I have choose the technique from left main to uh, LED. Initially, I have, my plan was to cross over. Stunting was my plan just because of the viability issues and uh, the patient has already had a MI. That's why I have changed the strategy at the at the eleventh hour when I thought there was a significant lesion in the circumflex. That's why I have changed the strategy to tap stunting. Uh, I would. I, I, I think. Would have I think. Mini, mini uh, crack, I agree to mini your crack planning, crack you know, It was. It was well done, and especially the patient was having post MI angina, and I hope that in the long run there will be some improvement in the LP systolic function as well. And yes. now we don't give credence to that much to viability test. Even the ACCH and the American Surgeons Association also they don't take up the patient for revascularization by seeing the viability. If the ejection fraction is less, they take the patient. It's a triple vessel patient, diabetic patient. They take the patient for devascular, means cabbage. So similarly, you know, viability tests are not that important nowadays because they are changing. You know, even five years back they were looking for the viability test, but now it's not that much of importance. Of course, for a CTO lesion or some other situation, we look for it, but here there is no question of viability because the patient is having angina. And uh, there is no, you know, old cell criterion also. Even if it would have been completely closed, then for three to twenty-eight days we should not intervene. But he was within twenty-four hours. Next day he was taken. So I think it's reasonable. Yeah, I think old dictum of when the patient was having angina. I think it's quite reasonable to take the patient. If the patient is clinic like they say, right? If the patient is clinically, electrically, or hemodynamically unstable, you intervene. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, we that's right. Left. We have only ten minutes left, um, so let's let's go ahead with the next presentation. Yeah, uh, Dr. Parveshwar Parikh with chip left main coronary artery bifurcation case. Dr. Parikh is joining us from uh, the Jeevraj Mehta Hospital in Ahmedabad. Can you see my screen? Uh, we cannot see it yet, sir. Oh, file कहाँ आया उसके? Cancer वाली? We cannot see the screen. Not yet. Not yet. We can see you, but not your screen. We cannot see your screen, Dr. Parikh. I hope you found that uh, that icon sh showing that share screen. Yeah, that I already clicked. I clicked on that icon. J j just click once. Yeah, now it's yeah. coming. I think. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, yeah it's coming now. Just uh, we'll hold on. Coming now. Can you see now? Now we can see Doctor Mama, Doctor Mustafa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why is that. I, I think uh, uh, Doctor Parik, you have to share the screen and. Uh, Choose the PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. I I think while Dr. Parik uh, gets this ready. Um, uh, what has been the experience of the and there's some technical issue but in the meantime uh, what is the experience of the of the panel and uh, are you in, in your practices across the country are you seeing a lot of covid and uh, primary uh, stemies or infrequent or frequent actually my experience with that covid and uh, acs is more than the primary, uh, like post-COVID period, you know, like uh, we used to get a lot of uh, cases with ACS. 
right. and uh, yeah uh, maybe like uh, probably the thrombotic uh, uh, i mean tendency is more and we we do get uh, quite uh, i mean lots of patients uh, coming during the post covid period in the post yeah yeah we we had a few primary stemies who have come in in the covid time and yeah. uh, You know, post- and an- yes. another another thing is like we have seen two cases of peripheral vascular uh, occlusions like acute limb ischemia post covid yep. i don't know the one femoral artery occlusion and uh, uh, two cases we had seen so i think it is not only in coronary it it, it can happen well, anywhere like there is one clinical dilemma which 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 i want to just see what everybody else does uh, you know a lot of patients in delhi and cr after they recover they are getting d dimer Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, now when they go home, they recover in two weeks later. They get a fever. They may or may not have been on steroid. The D dimer comes up two times upper limit of normal, three times upper limit of normal, ten times upper limit of normal. The CRP is normal, LDH is normal. What are the other? Uh, what is the? What are your industry practices? The guidelines that differ about anticoagulation. yeah what is my feeling is actually see most of these patients with like all this uh, cytokine storm they have this d dimer is taking longer time to come down so i think it is you, it is an accepted that. practice to continue them on oral anticoagulants for at least 3 months so most of these thrombotic uh, episodes happening like either it is acute coronary syndrome or it is a uh, thrombosis elsewhere it is happening mostly uh, during the post covid period maybe one month after or one and a half months so i think it is very important if somebody is having a very high d dimer they should be invariably put on oral anticoagulants for at least 3 months i think that's a standard yeah. uh, accepted yeah. uh, it's uh, it's it's very important to see the you know d dimer and also the il6 and the severe patients all should be given the benefit of anticoagulants because it's more of a vascular disease rather than an a viral infection or infectious you know therefore people are telling whether it's man made in the lab because the you know behavior of the something different from the normal viruses you know we have seen influenza we have seen other but the behavior of this particular infection is totally different in a few patients of mesenteric ischemia also and the gangrene you know so it it doesn't spare anything as you have rightly mentioned it involves the peripheral arteries likely it involves the mesenteric arteries as well and the patient presents after one month after five weeks six weeks with yeah, yeah. continuous pain abdomen and it's seen that the patient has got mesenteric ischemia with thrombosis so uh, one patient uh, presenting with uh, both uh, iota as well as ivc thrombus yeah i don't know <laughs> it was uh, yeah. it's a mind it's a peculiar disease yeah it's a peculiar. and i think it's good to continue with anticoagulants yeah. for three Four months, you know, as a precaution. Anybody with severe infection with high level of D dimer after after initial very high. Yeah, basically, Doctor Samir, I feel. Basically, Doctor Samir, I feel if the D dimer comes to normal, then four to six weeks are fine. If the D dimer is high, I think three to three months is a good time for anti. Yeah, yeah. We should give it for three months. Yeah. Absolutely. At home. they come back they check a d dimer mild covid nothing right and they come back with a d dimer and and i've asked the international the hematology community and the and there is no clear guideline as to what to do about it i've had you know i've had a story of one person who bled and uh, his hemoglobin yes, the guy, the guy. so you know you're hearing all these stories and you're always perplexed as to what the data is and now yes. Yes. which 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 oral anticoagulants you are all giving actually for this I, I, Uh, uh, hello let me open it to the panel my question is about rivaroxaban we we give rivaroxaban share to tell me i'm sharing it also screen share to tell me rivaroxaban 10 mg is the first choice then rivaroxaban 2.5 vd okay okay rivaroxaban 10 mg od yes yes yeah apixaban 2.5 mg bd yes yes Yeah, I, I know that this is an international conference, and we are discussing this. But this is <laughs> because that's the no, no. Every everyone has become a, I mean, a general practitioner or a physician these days. You know, like we all. <laughs> Doctor Vision has probably seen more COVID cases in the last one month than he's done because it is just how it is. Same with me. All of us. I think all of us. I think all of us have seen 
more covid than corona in the last month <laughs> Vijayan, Vijayan, we can't hear you. But in COVID, one thing we have noticed from it, that, you know, many of the patients have non-occlusive disease, you know. It's full of thrombus. The plaque is not that much. Yeah. So if we thrombolize initially, that can delineate because that dissolves the, you know, thrombus to a large extent and we can see the extent of plaque. And Sripal Bangalore has an article in NEGM last year, about a year back. He has given a few cases, and I think it was 18 cases only. And he has shown that in 46% of the patient, it was non-occlusive disease, which caused severe acute MI. Yeah, I saw that there was from a New York data. To, yeah, it's very important to have an early angiogram. In our center also, we are doing a lot of, you know, uh, primary cases in COVID patients because by the time we take the patients so within an hour or 70, 80 minutes, the patient, you know, if the patient of course comes early after arrival, I am meaning, and uh, by that time the COVID result doesn't come. So we take it as a positive case with PP and all the staff with PP, and we should also ensure that all the cath lab staff are having proper PP. So we are going through a difficult phase. And we are learning and seeing. And for your information, I would invite all of you to join us on 24th and 25th of July for our NIC. And uh, we are collecting the data in this COVID scenario that how people in our country, we have got such good innovative cardiologists like you. We had a glimpse what our country is doing. And all of us have shown beautiful, beautiful cases. And let us see what all over the country how many are going for primary PC? I don't know whether I will get all the data about the COVID. And uh, let us see how many are going for the primary PCI and how much of thrombolysis is occurring. At least we should have a glimpse of the situation, what's going on in the country as a whole. So, sir, another, another observation which I had in relation to ACS and COVID is, yeah. like the post-COVID period, some of patients coming with a troponin elevated I mean, troponin uh, are elevated and minimal ECE changes. But if you do an angiogram, you see a normal coronary. So we had a couple of cases like that also. But no, clinically, that's normal, Dr. Yeah. Mustafa, because yeah. you know, they are the myocarditis patient. Because even after recovery, you will get some tropi elevation. Tropi indicates that the patient has yeah. myocarditis. So and uh, one a friend of mine, he's a cardiologist and in charge and director in New York in one of the labs. And he was telling me, got myocarditis. What can you do? There is no medicines for that, for myocarditis. Yes. So most probably these are all myocarditis cases. So you get yeah, some yeah. Those are myocarditis patients actually. And you'll find a little reduced rejection fraction sometimes. So myocarditis is a part and parcel of the disease. And I tell you about, yeah, two... Uh, situations. One was in Germany, they studied 100 patients with CMR, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, and 78% of the patients showed myocarditis and reduced ejection fraction. And one European study, including different countries over there with 1300 plus odd patients, that showed that 52% of the patient had some sort of reduction of ejection fraction and some sort of myocarditis. So it's a very common finding. And in our country also, we are seeing a lot of myocarditis patients post-COVID. Even after a few months also, we are seeing there is reduced ejection fraction. Uh, Dr. Parikh, we have to, uh, now COVID cardiology is becoming a subject. <laughs> yeah, we are learning about it. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Parikh is having, he's, he's presenting the last case, but he's having some internet issues. Uh, Dr. Parikh, are you going to uh, verbally tell us about your case since the, there are some IT issues? Um, somebody from Translumina, is Dr. Parekh going to discuss his last case? I think some major IT issues over there. So um, we can, we are almost done with time. I mean, time is over, so we can continue to chat over here and talk about COVID, uh, <laughs> call it a day. Uh, but I think... Dr. Samir, uh, Dr. Samir, uh, this uh, session uh, will go offline in next two minutes. Okay.
I because we have another session running, uh, you know, uh, the next session on in next two minutes. So that's the reason. Yeah, then I think Dr. Shamir probably can wind up. I, I yeah, feel, you can yeah. conclude, I think. Yeah. So thank you, thank you everyone for joining us for this session. I hope you all learned something today. Yes. Uh, you know, I hope you all are smarter now and uh, you've seen some nice uh, cases and learned uh, from each other because that's the that's the utility of coming together in these forums. And I know it's the hour is late in the day, but you know we are all here just a marker of our commitment towards patient care and towards healthcare in general. So thank you so much. Uh, this was a great session. I thank all the panelists, all the chairpersons and uh, Translumina for bringing this all together. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night.